St. Petersburg, Russia, 2008. In the shadow of the Hermitage, in a city that has survived siege and revolution, a small group of programmers began building a computer worm that would infect the digital lives of hundreds of thousands of people across the globe. They called it Kubeface. Security firm estimates suggest it may have infected between 400,000 and 800,000 computers worldwide. Transforming Facebook from a social platform into the central infrastructure these criminals used to run their operations. The people behind this malware didn't just steal, they took complete control. They hijacked identities, drained bank accounts, and turned entire networks of personal computers into machines that worked only for them without the owners knowing. And perhaps most disturbing, they did this while living openly, posting photographs from resort vacations, their real names visible to anyone who cared to look. They understood that being identified meant nothing without extradition. Russian law created a barrier between being identified and actually being arrested. Kubeface wasn't just malicious code. It proved that trust between friends could be turned into a weapon, that Facebook friendships could become the pathway for spreading harmful software from person to person, and that neither Facebook's security systems nor international law enforcement could stop it. This is the story of how messages from friends became the delivery method for a computer virus, how social bonds were exploited to spread criminal software, and how the criminals who built this operation faced no prosecution. This story is based on documented events, official records, and information released by investigators and authorities involved in the case. Full list of sources is available in the video description. In 2008, Facebook had built itself with a dangerous weakness. The platform's engineers designed everything around one goal, make it as easy as possible for people to connect and share. Every feature was built to encourage clicking, sharing, and spreading content quickly. The company removed every obstacle, every security check, every warning message, every pause that might make users think twice before clicking a link. There were no systems to scan suspicious links before they were sent, no warnings when a message contained potentially dangerous website addresses, no recognition that a friend's account could be taken over and used to attack their contacts. Facebook had created the perfect environment for malware that spreads through friendships, and the people who built Kubeface saw this weakness clearly. The name itself was a taunt. Kubeface is an anagram of Facebook. It was a threat that should have been obvious, yet it succeeded because Facebook had built no defenses against attacks that used trust between friends as their weapon. The infection method was simple and effective. A message arrived from someone you knew, someone whose name and face you recognized on Facebook. The message was direct. You look funny in this video, or is this you? A link was attached. Because the message came through Facebook from a friend, most people clicked without thinking twice. The link took you to a fake YouTube page built to look real with copied logos and familiar design. A video player appeared with an error message, Adobe Flash Player required, click here to update. This wasn't Adobe Flash, this was the trap. The moment you clicked that button, your computer belonged to someone else. Kubeface mainly attacked Windows computers, though later versions used weaknesses in Java to infect Mac OS X computers with some components designed for Linux systems too. This ability to attack multiple types of operating systems showed real skill. These weren't amateur hackers learning as they went. These were programmers who understood technical details, like how Windows stores system settings and registry files, how Mac OS X controls which programs can access which files through permissions, and how to write instructions that computers running Windows, Mac, or Unix systems could all execute. Once Kubeface got inside a computer, it began executing a series of programmed commands. The malware didn't just infect the machine, it took over the victim's entire Facebook identity. It accessed Facebook passwords that were saved in the web browser and used those passwords to log in as you. Then it copied itself by sending identical messages to every friend in your contact list. The infected person became a spreader of the disease, transmitting malware to their own friends and family without knowing it. This was social engineering in its most effective form. The attack used a well-documented fact about human behavior. We trust messages from people we know. We believe our friends. The people who built Kubeface understood this and designed their attack to spread through networks of existing friendships, turning social connections into pathways for disease. But stealing your Facebook identity was only the first step. Once inside, Kubeface installed botnet software. This turned the infected computer into one controlled machine among thousands in a massive criminal network. The computer's processing power, 
which you paid for, powered by electricity from your bill, sitting in your home or office, was now working for criminals in St. Petersburg. Your computer was being used to send spam emails. It was launching distributed denial of service attacks. It was even mining cryptocurrency. You paid for electricity and wore down your hardware while the criminals extracted all the profit. The malware also installed key loggers, bank passwords, credit card numbers, social security numbers, medical records, personal emails. All of it was collected and transmitted to remote computers that the gang controlled. Reports document many cases of serious financial loss and identity theft. One case involved a Florida University professor who lost access to investment accounts when the key logger captured login credentials. That person spent years trying to prove the theft had happened, going through a draining process with banks, credit agencies, and law enforcement, hundreds of hours consumed trying to get back what had been stolen. Kubeface also hijacks search functions. When you tried to use Google or other search engines, the malware redirected your browser. You'd be sent to fake pharmaceutical sites and fraudulent antivirus programs. The criminals got paid for each redirected search, each click, each installation. Millions of infected computers became machines for generating fraudulent revenue. The computers would automatically click ads, install software, and create web traffic that looked real to advertisers who paid for engagement they thought was coming from genuine, interested customers. The way Coopface made money reveals an underground economy that runs parallel to legitimate digital business. Coopface didn't work alone. It installed packages of other malicious software, fake antivirus programs that claimed to find threats on your computer while actually creating them, browser toolbars that tracked every website you visited and every search you performed, selling that private information, video codec programs that did nothing except generate payment for the installers. Each installation earned the criminals between two and five dollars through paper install schemes. With potentially hundreds of thousands of infected machines, this generated substantial income every single day. Then came the click fraud operation. Every infected computer became a puppet in an advertising scam. The botnet made the computers mimic human behavior, moving the mouse cursor automatically, clicking ads without human input, scrolling through pages, to create what looked like real user engagement. The clicks were sent through VPN networks and proxy servers, making them appear to come from real users in dozens of different countries instead of from infected computers. Advertisers paid for attention they thought was real. They believed genuine people were clicking their ads and viewing their content. The Coopface operators collected that money through affiliate accounts. The criminals had set up accounts that appeared to represent legitimate websites bringing in traffic. Research by the International Watch and Monitor Group estimated that the operators earned more than $2 million U.S. million between June 2009 and June 2010 from click fraud and fake software installations alone. That figure represents only the visible, traceable money documented through affiliate network payment records. The stolen bank credentials, the harvested credit card information, the compromised PayPal accounts, these were sold on dark web marketplaces, but the total value cannot be determined from available records. The operation also connected to other malware distribution networks. Security researchers found that Kubeface infrastructure shared hosting providers and payment processors with other criminal operations. This showed the gang either rented their botnet capacity to other criminals or worked with other groups on specific campaigns. An infected computer might be used for click fraud during one hour, spam distribution the next, attacks against specific targets the hour after that, each activity generating money through different criminal channels. Security firms estimated that at peak operation, between roughly 400,000 and 800,000 machines may have been infected. That represents hundreds of thousands of people who had their digital lives compromised, their trust exploited, and their machines enslaved to serve criminal interests. Security researchers weren't just watching. By 2009, a distributed community of analysts had begun working systematically to tear down the Kubeface infrastructure. What followed was a technical war that showed both how sophisticated the criminal operation was and how hard it is to stop malware designed with multiple backup systems and automatic updates. Research teams began the slow work of reverse engineering the malware. They examined its code line by line. What they found was troubling. Kubeface was built in separate modules. It updated itself automatically, downloading new code from command and control servers to avoid detection systems. Each time researchers thought they had mapped how it worked and created detection signatures, the malware received updates that changed its code structure. The major breakthrough came when analysts identified the command and control infrastructure. Security firms used a technique called sinkholing, taking control of the internet domain names that the malware used to contact its controllers and redirecting them to servers under the researcher's control instead. 
When an infected computer tried to contact its controllers for instructions, it reached a researcher's server instead, cutting the connection between the malware and its operators. The infected computer would still be infected, but it could no longer receive commands to spread or steal data. But the Kubeface gang had built countermeasures. When domains were sinkholed, the malware automatically switched to backup domains from a pre-programmed list built into the code. The operators used domain generation algorithms. The malware would try these generated names one by one until it found one the criminals had registered and could use. Researchers had to predict which domains the algorithm would generate next and register them first, sometimes registering hundreds of domains in a single day. This became a continuous race, with researchers trying to register domains faster than the criminals could activate them. The investigation went beyond just domain names. Researchers tracked server clusters by examining hosting patterns, IP address ranges, and the specific configurations of Apache and Nginx. They found that many command servers were hosted on hacked, legitimate websites, small businesses and personal blogs that had been exploited through unpatched software and turned into criminal infrastructure without the owners knowing their websites were being used. Security firms set up honeypots. Through controlled infection, researchers could watch the malware's behavior in real time, capturing the commands it received from controllers, mapping the botnet's structure, identifying new versions as they appeared, and creating detection signatures that antivirus software could use to find and remove Kubeface. This was a war of grinding persistence. Every takedown was temporary. Domains were re-registered under new names, backup servers were activated, new hosting providers were recruited to replace ones that had shut down criminal operations. Every defense brought a new countermeasure, updated malware builds with different code, changed communication methods to avoid detection, encrypted command channels that couldn't be read even if intercepted. The researchers were driven by principle and persistence. The criminals were driven by millions of dollars in ongoing revenue and the apparent absence of legal consequences. In 2009, security researchers began tracing the Kubeface operation back to its source. What they found was disturbing, not because the criminals were hidden, but because they weren't. The operators hadn't used the typical methods of digital hiding that most cyber criminals use. They were visible on Russian social media platforms, Vkontakte and Odniklasniki, using their real names. They posted photographs from luxury vacations, Dubai, Barcelona, Turkey, trips that appeared to be funded by their criminal earnings. They showed off expensive cars, designer clothing, and seemed unconcerned about being visible. The investigation broke wide open through a single mistake. One of the suspected operators had registered an early command and control domain using a personal email address. That address was connected to legitimate online accounts, purchases, and social media profiles. Security researchers followed this trail through forum posts, social media activity, and transaction records, eventually connecting the malware infrastructure to specific people with verifiable identities, people whose real names, locations, and lives could be confirmed. In January 2012, the security firm Sophos and independent researchers publicly named five people they believed were core operators of the Kubeface gang, all based in St. Petersburg. Anton Korachenko, Stanislav Avdeko, Alexander Koltyshev, Sviatoslav Bondarev, and Roman Kocherbach. These weren't anonymous figures hiding behind multiple layers of technical concealment. They were identifiable people living visibly, confident that being identified carried no legal risk as long as they stayed in Russia. That confidence was justified. Reports show that around 2011, the United States issued arrest warrants and indictments. The charges were extensive. Conspiracy, computer fraud, wire fraud, and aggravated identity theft. If extradited and convicted, these people would have faced decades in prison. But they were in Russia, and Russia does not extradite its own citizens to the United States. Many analysts and researchers have documented that jurisdictional barriers, enforcement priorities, and Russia's constitutional ban on extraditing citizens created a situation where prosecution was impossible without Russian cooperation, which was not provided. Russia's constitution specifically prohibits handing over Russian citizens to foreign countries for trial, regardless of the crime. Commentators describe this as a de facto safe haven. The Kupface operation continued working after the public identification. The named individuals couldn't travel to countries with U.S. extradition treaties. They were stuck geographically in Russia, Belarus, and a small number of other aligned states. But that limitation seemed like an acceptable price for the wealth they had accumulated and the absence of prison time. One of the five, Stanislav Avdeko, was briefly detained in 2011 or 2012, but he was not prosecuted for involvement in Kube case. The lack of real legal consequences is not speculation. It is documented reality. This situation has created what some observers describe as a backwards incentive system. For talented programmers in St. Petersburg, there's a choice. Legitimate work for modest pay, 
or cybercrime targeting foreign victims with much higher earnings and minimal legal risk as long as operations stay outside Russia and don't target Russian citizens or Russian infrastructure. The unspoken rule, according to many researchers, is that Russian citizens and Russian computer systems must not be targeted. If you keep your crimes focused on Western countries, Russian authorities appear uninterested in stopping you. The Coopface gang understood this framework. As long as they stayed in Russia and aimed their operations at Western targets, they operated in a jurisdiction where U.S. warrants had no enforcement power and Russian authorities showed no interest in prosecution. The FBI could issue warrants, Interpol could maintain listings of wanted criminals. None of it mattered without extradition or Russian prosecution. Public records do not document arrests or convictions. These individuals remain suspected operators whose current status is unknown. Around 2012, the environment for Kubeface began to collapse. Facebook and other platforms finally put specific security measures in place. Automated systems began scanning message content for known malicious URLs, creating constantly updated databases of phishing links that were flagged and blocked instantly. Phishing is a type of scam where criminals create fake websites or messages designed to steal your information by pretending to be someone you trust. The platform set up behavioral monitoring. These could spot unusual patterns like accounts suddenly sending dozens of identical links within minutes, a clear sign that the account had been taken over by malware. Two-factor authentication was rolled out, making it much harder for malware to keep access to accounts even when passwords had been stolen. These defensive improvements, combined with more public awareness of phishing attacks, made social media increasingly difficult terrain for the worm. Infection rates collapsed as layered defenses made it progressively harder for Kubeface to spread and maintain its network of infected computers. By the early 2010s, security researchers reported that command and control servers were going offline. New infections dropped to nearly zero. The botnet that had enslaved hundreds of thousands of computers was shutting down. But the suspected architects of this operation had escaped accountability. After the public exposure and the shutdown of their infrastructure, the five named individuals seemed to disappear from public view. Social media accounts went dormant, the vacation photographs stopped, the digital traces that researchers had followed went cold. 